Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to another Real Conversation. This one with my man, Mike Taylor. We're, uh, we've already set this up, so we bought a bunch of shit coins and SPACs that we're going <laughs> to pump. All right? Uh, <laughs> we're going to pump because we already own them. And, and then after this, we're going to sell them. You came to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> it's still my favorite T-shirt, you know. <laughs> have I got a Have I got a spack for you, or uh, let's say an NFT? Yeah, or, you look like an NFT. Yeah, I tell you, this that is, is sweet. This was Ethereum. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what that was all about. Right. But um, welcome back. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, he's uh, live in studio, and it's fun to do this. Uh, you've lost some weight. You're looking uh, like Jonesy esque. That's the other guy who usually right. sits there. He's lost a bunch of weight. He my wife good. said the end is nigh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I yeah, I'm like. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no. I'm really happy. I'm. Uh, I actually started on uh, the Lily drug, uh, Manjaro. Did you? And um, and it's uh, a, a touch pricey, yeah. but uh, quite effective. No uh -huh. side effects. And uh, and I happen to be um, involved in the stock in the Pink Fund yeah. too. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's wonderful drug. Let's talk about the Pink Fund a little bit uh, as well. But on that topic, whether you're long Novo or Lily or both, I mean. Is, how do you think about the difference? And is this, I mean, you're obviously taking it. Um, so you think that this is the real deal? It's very much the real deal. Yep. And we didn't even, just for your viewers, we didn't even come on to prep this and what we're <laughs> gonna talk about. We're just no. saying, hey, you lost some weight, what's going on? Yeah. And, uh, and, and so the Lily drug, in my view, uh, Manjaro is a better, the best molecule out yeah. there. Um, best side effects, best efficacy, uh, best dosing. Um, and, and the big deal about this category, and for those of you that don't know, uh, Manjaro and others are part of this GLP-1 class, the glucagon-like protein-1 class. And it, uh, it essentially fools your liver into you thinking that you're sated. Uh, it, it, that's essentially how it works, or I believe how it works, because mm -hmm. there is quite a bit of debate as to how it actually works. My doctor told me, uh, let everyone try it, and then you'll know how it works. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you actually, yeah. you're an informed user, yes. whereas I'm completely unaware. Well, the, unbeknownst to many, this class has actually been out for many years mm -hmm. in millions and millions of patients for diabetes. And uh, it's very well tolerated, uh, great results. And a uh, key fact that we saw earlier this year was outcome study mm -hmm. uh, for an, an, a very high risk outcome study. And outcomes refers to, um, let's say, people that have already had a cardiovascular event, heart attack, mm -hmm. and then putting them on this drug and seeing, hey, does it happen again? Do you have a stroke? Do you have another heart attack? Things like that. And the data showed a 20% improvement, meaning one in five uh, did not have a recurring heart attack. And many might say, hey, that's, that's not really a big deal. You'll have to be that one in five to actually really benefit. And I would submit, no, this is an incredibly high risk population. And when you go into lower risk populations, people who have a weight problem, mm -hmm. maybe a little hypertension problem, usually they go hand in hand. They also have a pre-diabetes problem, which is the vast majority of those same people. Mm -hmm. um, you will get the weight loss and incredible outcomes over a longer period of time. It's less stress on your kidneys, it's less stress on everything in your heart. And, uh, and I think that this class is, there's a really good chance this is gonna be the biggest class dollar-wise ever of any class. Mm. And bigger than Viagra. Mm. And, and you, not that I don't support your irresponsibly yeah. long t-shirt, I do. Well, I, I like that, Mike. I like how you pivoted there. Uh, but on that, so what I've, the way that, you know, I kind of like implement these things. First of all, I own Lily too, uh, not because you told me to. I also own NVO, and I don't know why, uh, mm -hmm. other than, you know, to a degree that these things are signaling by. <laughs> this is how I do it. But what I really do is wrap it back into the macro process. So I said to Rooster the other day, who you just sat down with quickly, um, I said, give me every healthcare ETF that ticks. And so first of all, I needed to bake the cake, so I put them all into the machine. And I'm like, these things look like X pink, there are two, like literally two healthcare ETFs yes. that were not bearish, not just bearish trade, um, actually pink broke trade, but that's a short-term momentum indicator because uh, the group did, I think. But trend, there are only two in the entire population of ETFs manufactured out there. And lo and behold, the other one was the one that had a, like, a, a gargantuan position in Lilly. Ah. Uh, so it was right. like, it's number one holding was Lily. And I mean like it was 25% of the ETF, which is not uncommon these days. But your ETF, uh, and you're not paying me to pump this, it's just pink spin something that we've been 
uh, long, but it's outperformed like uh, I think by 15% since inception uh, against like something that would be considered your bogey, like the Fidelity Healthcare. Uh, um, oh, thing or is that is oh that my, right? Thank you. Am I? Are we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just oh, threw up. The, they yeah. just threw up. Okay, a chart. so this is what Rooster's doing. He's showing me all the different you know performance. So first of all, Mike does this for free. Um, you know, it goes. Maybe you can hit on that quickly because I know that that's what's most important with this. Oh, I don't think you knew. I knew that you're good, but I didn't. I don't think you knew you'd outperform like that. Like, were um, you trying to even do that? You were doing trying to do a good thing for. We're doing a good thing. Yeah. So we're doing a good thing. Uh, so pink is a healthcare actively managed ETF because that's what I know. Yep. That's what I've done for 20 years. And uh, the fees are very modest and uh, uh, less than the vast majority of funds out there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be specific about it because then the compliance people will be all over me. Uh, but the proceeds of those fees goes to the Susan Coleman uh, Foundation yep. for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. As does my compensation, I, I run it for free. Uh, and, and I love to run it for free. Now, it's not exactly free, though, <laughs> because uh, it does benefit me. I happen to be one of the largest shareholders of Pink, yeah. and I should, uh, I should relay that. Well, that's important. I mean, but, uh, but my goal is to uh, outperform uh, the peers and provide an incredibly compelling business opportunity for the investors in that they can do good mm -hmm. and do well. Mm -hmm. So do something good for an incredible number of people that are suffering breast cancer and families that mm -hmm. suffer. Because it's not just the individual that suffers breast cancer and cancer in general, it's the family that is under duress. And the Susan Coleman Foundation has been the forerunner in providing support across the board for mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. And, and I'm so happy to be part of that. It's, mm -hmm. it's an honor. And, and to do it uh, for free and put in my sweat and toil, but you know me. This isn't sweat and toil. It's just other people calling it sweat and toil. Yeah. If I'm breathing, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, that's I what love you love it. Yeah. I love it. And awesome. if I don't get paid for it, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to do it. Yeah. And and that's just you know, the, how it works. The family point that you just hit, like, and it doesn't hit you till it hits you. Like one of my best friends, she just she just got it, and we know the family very very well. And it's just so devastating in the very immediate term. And that support and just to kind of you know, like just trying to get to some level of, uh, it's not going to be normal. But it's you know to me it's it was it, it was it sh shook me, I'd say. Well, since I've been and before I did this past twenty years, I did drug development around uh, gene therapy, virus work, things like that. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen over the past twenty years is an accelerating golden age renaissance in medicine, mm -hmm. where I, I mean think about it. We just talked about it earlier in this programming, where we now have the tools to eliminate obesity. Amazing. That, yeah. without surgery, yeah. you know, uh, where we can change your biology just a little bit to get you there. Yeah. Uh, we also have immunotherapeutics to treat cancer. That's brand new, turning your immune system to sick the cancer tumors mm -hmm. and, uh, and get much better outcomes for that reason. Now, we are just in the first inning of figuring this out. And so over the next 20 years, we're going to have a renaissance again. Yeah. And I view that cancer is going to be uh, either a curable or chronic condition where you may have cancer but it's just going to be part of your life mm -hmm. just like where yeah you know okay i'm balding mm -hmm. i got cancer well you're not going to die from balding you're not going to die from cancer you're going to die from something wouldn't else hopefully elite? old age wouldn't that be elite? but this I mean, is where yeah. it's going to go yeah this morning i cited a book called the age of scientific wellness by dr lee hood and um and yeah, he's, he really made the same point. You can launch off that same pad of wellness you know, and launch off the same pad in terms of our profession. Using all these tools, predictive tracking algos, stochastics, you know, our Bayesian inference process, and I'm like, it's the same thing. But what's different is that in healthcare, of course, or wellness, as opposed to our profession, there's no jumping off that pad. Everybody's gonna be along the AI, but they're not gonna apply it to the profession. I find this to be fascinating. They're still going to stick. No, they might as well just stay there with the slide rulers and pre-internet when they when they start with their process. It's just an amazing thing to watch. Yeah. Um, anyway, this uh, the the ETF because now everyone's going to ask me about it. The ETF that I was comparing pink against is um, the ticker on this one is IHE. So this is the iShares Dow um, Pharmaceutical Index Fund. But but look at this thing. I mean, this, I'm not picking on this yeah. thing. I'm just saying like Lily is 26 percent, and then J and J was 20, and I don't J and J signal says sell, and 
in my, in my process. So I'm like, I'm not, not going to buy that one. That's how quickly I can say, no way. Yeah. So if you're going to make an ETF two stocks, I mean, I, you might as well just make it one stock and I'll just own Lily. That's a, not a fund. It's a dangerous notion. Yeah. To ever do that. And, uh, but this is in all ETFs, Mike. Yeah, the concentration, sure. Right. So how do you think about, like, let's just kind of jump from healthcare to the big stuff. Because XLK is five, you know, 50% NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple. You know, XLY, consumer discretionary is 40% Tesla and Amazon. Mm -hmm. Like, as the world goes, these, you know, the stock market, it's basically, you know, we have seven stocks. Well, you know, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the catch. Right. And um, I had a really great conversation with your good friend, uh, Mike Green, yep. uh, this week. And he was talking about a pension fund that he uh, was working with and goes down and sees them. And I won't say which one. Uh, and they were saying, well, our goals are, you know, a three or four percent return. And we're putting all of our money in this and all of our money in that. And we're putting it in private equity and doing that. And Mike's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> You should be putting it all in one-year treasuries to get over your hurdle rate, and we're done with no yeah. risk. Right. You got it. Yeah. And they're like, well, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not part of our uh, planned outline of what we do. This is an active, managed pension fund that should be you know, thinking about risk, return, goals, and they're not allowed to think about risk, return, goals. Mm -hmm. So they have this, but they're, they're worried that if we didn't do all that private equity and we didn't own these FANG stocks, we could still blow, kill our goals with no risk. But they're afraid of doing that, exactly that, because if they're wrong, they're fired because they went off their plan. You know, this is, this is a major issue for uh, an entire generation, right? I mean, because yes. we don't, I was, I was querying this the other day because I was on the fly saying, what if you compounded the 5%, the risk-free? You, know, you can get, like right now we have TFLO, which is rolling a bit, so it's 5.31%. But I, I play these, like these are things that I have my hard-earned capital in, right? Risk-free until it's not, okay? If I compound 5% um, for five years on a million dollars, that's $1.273 million. If I up it to Mike's PA, then we can go up and, and you know, add zeros. But again, if you, if you have a $10 million account, Compound 5% with no risk for five years. Again, that's, uh, you're gonna go from 10 million to $12.73 million. Or, yeah, $12.73 million. Why wouldn't you do that? Because <laughs> we well, like to pick sectors yeah. and stocks, I get that, but. but. But for the masses, the return right now on the shorter end of the risk-free curve is Unbelievably attractive. Yeah, um, and and, and most become, of the masses don't have it in. I have it on. It's in their it, I, Apple iPad. Yes. They can get it, and they don't even know. And absolutely, and your, your your listeners should also know that when you look at the and and I don't have the chart, and I you probably don't have the chart offhand. Is that if you look at the weightings to uh, of the masses for equity versus risk free bonds right now, it is at the wild extremes. So at this moment in time, we have a world that's wildly overweight equities mm -hmm. and massively underweight bonds. Uh, there's some reasons for it. Yep. Uh, I think that a big piece of it is, uh, I'd say, retail FOMO. Mm -hmm. And I only say that because uh, we've had a deluge over the past three years since the free checks went out by the government of new retail accounts opening up. And you know, what do they do? They buy what they know. Yep. And that's not the treasury bond. So we're seeing this sort of like allocation just on that FOMO situation. Um, mind you, this is a generation of people that has never actually seen a down market. Mm -hmm. So this is this is very important. Important. They, they saw, to but it lasted like two months, and then they got checks in the mail. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Didn't see it. Didn't happen. So, uh, so as soon as we get, in my view, we're, we're on the cusp, and this is why we're talking about pricing power. And I realized that's, that's what we're supposed to talk about because I thought that's the really big deal. What has pricing power and what doesn't? Mm -hmm. And as pricing power begins to deteriorate, which it is, right around mid-year, that's when I thought it would happen. And I've been a little bit surprised with how fast it happened. And pricing power, by that you mean like an airline ticket? Discounting. Yep. Discounting is pricing power. Uh, we had an incredible rally bout of incredible pricing power because everyone got money, demand went up, and now they spent it. Well, now we're at the end of we spent it looking at impossible comps where the new checks aren't coming. In fact, bills are coming due, mm -hmm. student loans. Uh, you, uh, you talked about this morning, SNAP. 
Mm -hmm. Big deal. Huge. Big deal. 30 very, million households. Very difficult comps that come through. And the companies just put up pricing power. A lot of it went right to the bottom line, so they have really great margins, very juicy, a pretty expensive employee base. If that pricing goes just like that, just, just like that, poof, comes right off the bottom line, because they're not going to fire the people right away. They're going to wait. They're going to wait probably about five months. So, but in N four Q, yeah, that's and, when and we the got people the they keep might get if these strikes continue, they might have to pay them even more. While that's happening, while they keep the people, if Ford is still a company, maybe. No, okay. <laughs> so let's get into that. You think you think Ford uh, is going to be a company? Oh. <laughs> it's that's it's got a, it's some market one. cap, Mike. And uh, we didn't mention this one, um, uh, Ford. I do not have a position in Ford at the moment, Okay. Um, but I, I am active uh, in these sort of things. Uh, and I do have positions in others. Um, but uh, yeah, Ford, uh, Ford has this huge problem in that they have a, um, a weak management team and a dream. Mm -hmm. And the only company where I've ever seen where dreams come true is Elon Musk and, and Tesla where you can make an incredible promise, never deliver, and your stock goes up 10x. Mm -hmm. Ford, unfortunately, actually has to deliver, and they have. They made a bunch of electric cars that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. So they have a real, real big problem, and they're gonna have to discount in order to get them off the lots. And I have no, when I model out Ford, I, I, I have trouble finding the year that they make money. And I think that they're going to burn through that cash trove over the next two years. And honestly, I think Musk's plan is to bankrupt Ford. I think that's the one that because he's basically producing cars, uh, not with much profit, if any at all. But he knows that everyone that he's selling out the door is not a Ford. And so Ford's going to have to eat it and eat it and eat it and eat it. And eventually one of these guys is going to bust. Hmm. So. Well, it's interesting. I mean, on this on this big theme of yours, um, you you we have some big time. We just mentioned two two big time levered, you know, cost heavy, people heavy businesses in big auto and airlines. Yes. Like we were showing this airlines chart this morning. For those of you that didn't see it, Eric, you can show it. I mean, people talk about their soft landings. I mean, this is a crash landing that hasn't landed yet. Yes. I mean, Eric, look at that. Look at that chart, man. I mean, it's like. At the, what could possibly go wrong? In July, people were saying it's different this time. I'm going to buy an airline stock because it's cheap. Well, it's cheap so, on, the, so on the wrong numbers. This uh, is funny. Right at the highs, because I'm looking at that chart right now with you, right at the highs when they were doing their phone calls for the quarter, I t tweeted out. I'm like, are people listening to this? <laughs> because they were just like, hey, everything's good. We beat the quarter. Little problem with pricing on tickets. And th this is my ear that I'm listening to. <laughs> Whenever I hear a little stinking problem with pricing, and short that ETF, I think you had the jets up, yeah. is one of my biggest positions. Really? Since that, as soon okay. as that happened, because as soon as pricing goes bad, it doesn't get better soon or easily. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where, and that's, that has been my ear. As soon as the, the original uh, automakers, you know, GM, mm -hmm. Ford, Stellantis, uh, all of them say, well, we're gonna have to start uh, discounting. Well, that means pricing power, negative. Kill it, because there, once you take the price down five, 10% on the automobile with a rebate, whatever, that's, that's enormous to the bottom line. And they have just been, all these companies, so many have been minting it on the bottom line with the pricing power. As soon as it goes negative, there's nothing they can do. It's, it's interesting, this ETF jets, the number one is Delta, 11%, mm -hmm. Love is 10, UAL's 10, AAL is 10. So those four are 40 percent, and then it drops off. Have you gone through any of these names, or do you have absolutely? Any, or, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I am bearishly positioned. Love, Southwest, uh, Sizeola, because you really had to go after the domestic carriers, okay, especially towards the lower end. And the reason why uh, I go and look at the lower end was uh, you, you got to segue into all of the different uh, data points that we got. If you li anyone listened to Discover Card Services, yep. uh, the guy was like, hey, it's been 20 years. Things are really good. I'm out of here. <laughs> 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 he's like, we have a little problem with our little problem and peace out. And, uh, and that's what happened with, uh, with uh, Discover. That is the client who flies on Southwest. 
Yeah. So if you can start piecing together, you know, that now if you take a step down, people with even worse credit, where do they shop? Dollar General. Mm. What does Dollar General look like? It looks like it looks like there's no end to how far people it can can't go down. believe that one. It's like you know this wasn't supposed to happen. No, in fact, usually it's kind of the top end. Everyone goes downstream, right? You, you downgrade. Okay, I'm not going to shop at Walmart. I'm not going to yeah. shop at Target. I'm going to go to Dollar General, or I'm going to, you know. And but, that's not what happened. It was a very this is this is a really really interesting time. I think it has a lot to do with the fiscal stimulus that we had, where it was actually kind of the middle and upper that really benefited mm -hmm. from it the most, and now that's starting to peter out, where we saw it on the low end originally. And what you find, so, I mean, I talked about this on on uh, the macro show this morning. I just rattled off all of the statistics: credit cards, credit card debt, you know, lack of payments, et cetera. Wall Street's classic mistake is that that's not them. You know, that's not the life they lead. So their qualitative observations about the consumer are, are solely about, and it's, it's egotistical and it's disgusting, but uh, it, it lacks empathy to the core. But you know, what's going on in America for at least two thirds of the country is not Wall Street. Well, I mean, <laughs> three thirds yeah. of the country. Three thirds. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, that's an interesting point too. I mean, it, um, you kind of, I was, you, know, you kind of look at what you need to make to not be feeling it at this point. And, oh, CPI went from nine to three, now it's going back to four. Okay, great. Did, did anything really change? So what I try to do to get ahead of it is that I'm looking at a lot of data points in my business world outside of Wall Street yep. so that I can see the real thing. Yep. Uh, and I'm, in, I'm involved with a very sophisticated uh, real estate group, a small one, but they're national. Mm -hmm. And uh, he calls me up uh, a couple weeks ago. We talked about you're this. You're involved. Like you're back. a real estate investor with, you know, you're, well, you're, you have skin in the game. You know, I, I was involved in that. It, it's funny how I got involved. I got involved because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So I had known these guys. I hadn't been involved with them. And, uh, and I called them up and said, uh, I know you guys haven't done a hotel before, and this is during COVID. I said, but we need to get hotels right now, and I want in. Mm -hmm. And they, we picked out some hotels we did, and it absolutely killed it. And so after that, because you know, they, who knew when COVID was gonna end, right? I had a view on that, and I'm always thinking about how can I actuate that view? Yep. Well, I, I couldn't do it over here, I couldn't do it over there, but there's gotta be some distress, distressed hotels somewhere. And uh, after that time, I've been uh, very close with them, uh, helping them out with the economics because, mm -hmm. you know, surprise, surprise, uh, some very large, uh, sophisticated real estate investors, they aren't terribly sophisticated on the macro, mm -hmm. even though they have an incredible view on the ground floor as to what's happening. Mm -hmm. So he calls me up last week and he says, does everyone know we're in a recession now? And I'm like, no, they don't. Okay, tell me, what's utilization like? tells me that the utilization at their multi-unit properties, and this is not just the ones that we own, but the ones that we don't own, because uh, he's looking at every deal everywhere, is 91, 92%. It's usually 95 to 96. Wow. So that means that, and he said, it's not a big deal if it's this or that or a few or whatever. He goes, it's all of them. So people are making choices, bunking up with each other, moving back home to mom. Um, and, and, and you see that because those are real world decisions that have to be made. Mm -hmm. And it's very, and it's very, on a very short timeline, man. And, you know, oh, I can't do it. I'm not renewing my lease. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. And it'll happen, and it did happen over a two month period where it dropped so substantially. Um, and that I think we're starting to see in the numbers. And that's a leading indicator. Uh, I'd also bring up uh, racing. As you know, my son is uh, very involved in uh, racing. He's awesome at racing. <laughs> he, he, he likes to go in circles, let's just say that. Well, Mike won't, he, does, he, he won't pump his own tires on Pink's performance. He won't pump Max's tires on how fast he races those tires. But you know, like he, the guy races at the highest level now, isn't he? Like in cart, I forget what the category is. But well, he, he, I, I, will, I will just say it. He did finish uh, without practice or racing for karting, which is the, kind of the entree to racing cars. He did, uh, he, he, we had six free weekends, so he could do the National Pro Tour, uh, which goes throughout the year. And uh, he finished as a vice champion, nearly hitting uh, P1 by a handful of points. I love which it. was uh, awesome. really exciting for him. He was so upset, but I was like, Max, do you realize, you know, you rode six <laughs> times this year just for these races. These kids are in this every single, and you just came and wiped them up. It's great. And he, he also had uh, many podiums and uh, his first win in uh, IndyCar uh, recently, which was really, 
very car, nice. not cart. Yeah, this is an indie car, you know, like American F1. Yeah. And uh, so, it, but my point is that I want to get to. Uh, and by is, the way, you do have your dad has to have some money to be able to do this, I think. Oh no, it's free. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> so uh, He's part of the uh, Gen Z guys. If you want to show the uh, yeah, part of the uh, seventy percent of Gen Z and millennials uh, that are, he, are, he's not living paycheck to paycheck, paycheck, but definitely live with their parents. Uh, slide sixty-two. Uh, but uh, well, he's fifteen. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so, yeah. um, mom still makes his breakfast and does his laundry. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, I'm no different. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the entries, though. Uh, and many of the races were down 30 to 40 percent throughout the back half of this year. Yeah. And that, per good, per, hey, you know, when you're cutting out the racing, all these sort of pieces, I see it falling into place. Okay, how do I trade that? What do I do? What do I prep for? What do I look for? And Hedge Eye, and I don't mean to pump this, uh, as you know, I'm a paying client. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I don't even get valet parking here. I'm not getting comped or anything, you know? So, uh, and, and I, uh, I think you've done an amazing job and Hedge Eye has been a, a really big piece of my process. And it has been since he started. Mm -hmm. I think I was a client in 09. I appreciate and I think that. it was a two guy team at that time pretty yeah. much. Now, so. you know, on the call, you know, these guys are like pushing each other around to try to get their airtime. But yeah, that morning meeting, I know you listened to that. We appreciate the, look, this point, um, and I appreciate that general compliment. Um, but slide 45, guys, I mean, what's interesting, you know, because we're, you can talk about three, like it was, that was funny. I say two thirds and you one up it by a lot. But, you know, rich people, if you look at it year over year, this is luxury goods consumption. I mean, that was a bubble too, right? So, you know, whether or not you're signing your kid up to try to, you race Mike Taylor's kid at the highest level of karting or not, you're just you're just seeing the spending just was unsustainable at every level. I, and, and, and this, I'll bring up a stock too that this I is pleasure to be. boats, aircraft, buying private planes, yeah. jewelry, oh, watches. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I'll say I, I'm short uh, HZO. Yeah. Uh, Rainmax. Uh, yeah. I don't even know the name of the company, <laughs> but because uh, you know, and in my business, you just know tickers. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm short HZO. And, uh, and now I'm looking at this and I'm looking at all the checks that went out in the front half of this past year, all the employee retention credit checks that went out to all these small, medium business owners. They bought a boat. Guess what's not going to happen the front half of next year? They're not gonna buy that boat. No. And the Good comps point. are impossible. Okay, so you dial it in. That's it, comps are impossible, dial in. How am I wrong? I have no idea. So you put it on and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, also that chart brings to mind the chasers. Oh boy. The chasers, I don't mean the stock chasers, I mean the management mm. chasers. Yeah. Where they're like, whoa, 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 luxury really good. We need to get there. We need to be an aspirational buyer company. We need to be Ralph Lauren. <laughs> so Ralph Lauren, and, and I'm bearishly positioned RL too. Um, uh, Ralph Lauren said, we're gonna become an aspirational, but we're gonna take our prices up 30%. And in doing so, they've done well. Yeah. Pricing has gotten better, the margins got better, all that sort of stuff, except the foot traffic has just gone mm -hmm. down, down, down. So it's really difficult to be an aspirational brand when you are a store at an outlet mall, like Ralph Lauren. That's the problem. They have too many stores. So I think they're going to be unsuccessful in attracting new customers and holding on to existing customers. And we're on the cusp for Ralph Lauren to, for the pricing to peter out and the, that foot traffic to crater. Mm -hmm. And I think we're gonna run into a problem very near term. So now he's rattled off Lauren. a bunch of shorts, um, but again, so we're using pricing power. Yes. So you wanna be short pleasure boats, anyone trying to sell you, know, sell you an airline stock. What, what, give us a couple other ideas that you really like on the short side. Well, I'm looking at the student loans, and I've talked about it for, oh, yeah. God, years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so for Just those of you problem, that... Wall Street says that's, that's about... I, I saw some strat people send me their shit, like the old wall shit. Yeah. And I'm like, so we, we said it could affect two-thirds of rate of change, not the total number, two-thirds of the rate of change of real personal consumption expenditures, because mm -hmm. that was the impact on the way up. People are like... How is that possible? I mean, well, how is it possible that they have an opinion without having done any math at all is one question. So what they do is they send me the talking point of the old wall guy who says, oh, student loans are maybe, maybe 0.2, 0.2, 3% of GDP. 
Yeah, and that's oh, how that they're doing better. it. better. It does sound better. It's going to have no impact at all. We're good. <laughs> We're good, except the former CEO of Discover Card Services knows the truth. And the truth is, well, they all have a heck of a lot of leverage. I'm holding his mic for him, you know. Well, wait a minute. Let's, let's get it out because we're talking about sweet dreams that can only be manifest by. <laughs> what is that? This is, this is a gift my wife gave me uh, about 20 years ago. And it is a magic wand that I've had on my desk since then to make all my trades come true. And so I'll sit there and my guys know this. My guys on the desk know I have been seen doing this to the screen for years and I will bring it out when a fairy tale is being told. And the fairy tale is the impact of 0.2 to GDP. Because the truth of finance, how it works, is it's not money. It's borrowed money. Yeah. Borrowed money. And these student loan payments, and strangely, the White House did figure it out, what a huge problem this is. And that's why they tried to make up every reason possible to uh, prevent these payments from happening. Is that the, the people that are going to have to pay these loans back now, and it is about $400 per uh, borrower a month for about 30 net, 30 million people, which is a very large number. And that demographic is almost entirely 40 years old and under, okay? And we can rattle off a few other of those pieces there, but they have loans with Discover Card Services, with all that sort of stuff. And that money is going out, nothing's coming in for it. It is simply a new payment. And so what it is going to immediately impact is the cost of leverage and debt. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm really worried about, is that they're gonna have trouble making their credit card payments. And so is the CEO of Discover, former it's a, CEO. And it's, it's not just people that are levered, it's, it's people that are in the higher income brackets, which kind of surprised too. me. That Guys, too. go to slide 80. Uh, this is showing you um, drilling down into student loans um, and just looking what percentage of uh, it is as a percentage of, of, of households with student loan debt. But as you dig underneath the hood, it, it's like dentists and people that are going to grad school, they're the ones with the, the bigger balance of the numbers, right? So, Who would have known a dentist more than doctors? <laughs> slide 81. This is highly educated and high earning. The answer is no. Yeah. It's more likely that you're highly indebted and less credit worthy. And so that's where we're kind of at now. And I'm, you know, that's frightening because a dentist probably bought a boat. Definitely. If they own their own practice, they got a big check. Yeah. So yeah. Big checks. Big checks. Big, big decks, checks. big checks. Yeah. So the, so the thing that gets to me, you wanted me to say another name, and this is how I segue into it, um, was that, that it's all 40 years old and younger for the most part that are hitting these student loans. So you go after, uh, what is the greatest money suck of all time for millennials? I'll tell you, you don't have to answer. It's called video games. <laughs> Dave and Buster's. Dave and Buster's. Dave and Buster's. GameStop. Play. I mean, we're, you know, you just go down a list and I embarrassingly position play. Yep. Um, and see that one. Play is a ticker for Dave yeah. and Buster's. By the way, in the last cycle, Dave and Buster's went bankrupt. The ticker used to be DAB. Um, can, that was a bagel, or as, as Mike Taylor- Plotto. Plotto, <laughs> or visiting, as Mike Taylor says, Dr. Zero. Yes. I mean, so, so, House call. So plays the new post-private equity play on play, which mm -hmm. is still Dave & Buster's without the ball pit. So, so nothing's bad yet in it, except the stock has started to roll off. But, yeah. but you, you want to go after names, in my view, that are squarely at the epicenter of 40-year-old and under mega discretionary consumption. And that would include DoorDash, um, Etsy. Not so much Etsy, though, it will get wrecked, but DoorDash, because y your analyst just said today on the call, I listened to it while I was driving up here, and he said, oh, you know, casual dining is really the first one to hit with discretionary spending, right? Mm -hmm. So be very cautious about discretion. Well, how about this? How about a discretionary dining that costs 30% more for no reason, except it gets delivered to your house? So DoorDash will be first, and mm -hmm. then it's casual dining. Yeah, is it? Like, so, so, so you 15-year-old son, so you have this experience. My son uh, no longer asks mom to make him lunch. He just orders DoorDash. I have a daughter with that <laughs> problem. I'm like, what did you just pay for Shake Shack? It, it's like incredible. Like, and and the lack of. I mean, you can imagine me disciplining him after I see this bill. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, you understand what you just spent? Like, just because you're hungry? Nope. I mean, get the fucking peanut butter out and some bread. 
and you know, like it's, it's just the, the level of awareness of the generation, but parents have put all this on their phones. Yeah. You know, so, so, it's, just, so it's just a click. Yeah. A couple yeah. clicks. So that, have you thought about that? I mean, that's not like a video game, but it's also the life, it's the lifestyle. Yes. And, and post pandemic, people got into that spending. Like there's an oblivious nature to me, right? About what my son does until he glaringly orders like too much Shake Shack. We're seeing that oblivious problem manifest now. And you see it in auto loans. Uh, if you're sub 40 year old and have an auto loan, uh, the delinquency rate, 90 days or more, is about 8%. And that's at full employment. Yeah. But that nice number car. is insane. <laughs> and essentially, all of those loans are underwater, too. Yeah. So even when the repo man gum comes, you know, the bank's just like, we don't even want it. I mean, we could have put it on a lot and auctioned it off at 40% less than we thought it, or marked what it was worth. So you have this collateral problem. And these are the things we're going to walk into as collateral problems, especially around commercial real estate, which is its own other rolling disaster, which will take about two years to play through. Mm -hmm. But we will definitely feel it next year in a big way. Now, so. let's tie this back to what you know really well and all the conversations you have, which is a lot of these shorts will have these episodic and non-trending squeezes, but they can put a book out of business. Oh, yeah. Like you got... You take commercial real estate shorts. You know, like oh. one of our top clients who used to work with you, so you'd know him because he runs one of the biggest real estate long short books on the planet. Um, he's like, okay, it, like, can I ever short BXP ever again? Boston Properties, uh, mm -hmm. S SL Green. He's like, these things just don't go down. I'm like, that's because basically all long short guys have been told that they can no longer short them. And you know, there are dynamics to that flow, especially into July, where everything yes. became unshortable. Now, the things that lead the decline are most rolling short basket, all the shit. You know, really since August 1st, those factor exposures have led the decline. You know, the broad decline has not been huge in the S&P, but you've seen high short interest, high beta, um, a, a small cap. You know, these things have really started to come unglued because they're still pieces of shit. They're mm -hmm. just allowed to go down now. What do you see there? Well. I will say that shorting is the hardest, most thankless, miserable job on earth, and I recommend it for nobody. So I, I'm well loved for it. Yeah, yeah. doing it, it publicly, it, it, and it is. And unfortunately, as you know, and many of your viewers know, I did it for a long time, uh, and I still do. Still but do. I, mean, I did it running a much, much larger fund than just my PA uh, for a very long time, and and and. You know, for better or for worse, I was good at it on the short end, and kind of I wish I wasn't because it would have been much easier to just be good on longs because that's how most people are good. Uh, there's been an incredible number of consumer books that have been shut down mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't get the timing on the short. And we saw an incredible number of shorts move. Consumer 40, 50, meaning 100. hedge fund consumer consumer, consumer stocks. Books. Yeah. So they cover the consumer space, yep. and that's what they run. A hundred companies in consumer long versus short, and they have to thread the needle every day. Yeah. And tough. in fact. In many cases, when you are look uh, along your uh, list of uh, shorts or, or just any names and you look at the short interest for all of them, I have it all in my screen, and just know that the vast majority of all those shorts and you see 10, 15 percent short interest, it's 20 guys running books between Millennium and Citadel. And that's literally 15, 20 percent of the entire float is 20 guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. It's a knife fight mm -hmm. when it comes down to it. And these are battleground stocks <laughs> and they are moved by these people daily. Yeah. And when somebody blows up and gets liquidated, it causes a cascade of everyone else getting blown up and liquidated and liquidated and liquidated. And you get these wild moves in stocks, you know, hence uh, what happened to AMC mm -hmm. uh, earlier on, uh, which was stunning in itself. And retail has played a large role in running some of these up. And people, like I say it all the time uh, internally, I'm like, because our analysts will be like, well, what is your signal saying because something's getting squeezed? I'm like, well, that's probably two guys just blew up their book and they have to cover yeah. or they're shutting down their book. It's nothing, like, it's not like the company's out telling people that they sh things that they shouldn't. It's, there's no new fundamental information. It's just the dynamics of the machine right now. The dynamics of the machine. 
And it's a moving ball on what those dynamics are. It moves around an awful lot, so you have to stay tuned to it if you're going to be a really active trader, especially shorting. Yep. Uh, so, so when I, I look at these things like Vernado and other things in this uh, real estate sort of heavily levered finance things, a lot of them have fully recovered, even though they have a huge problem on their hands. And that's one of the issues about shorting is that if you're going to put it on, you need to be absolutely certain that it is going to work in the very near term mm -hmm. and have a very good reason for it. Mm -hmm. And usually it is a, a turning, a, essentially you know something that the owners haven't figured out yet or they don't care, meaning they're not paying attention enough to even know. Mm -hmm. And once you can put those sort of things together, now you got a trade idea. Uh, but when you're looking at this commercial real estate crisis that is going to persist through 24 and 25 and turn into a huge problem, it's not yet on the table, even though bankruptcies, delinquencies, and all these things are going up. There will be a moment when it is. I don't have that moment yet, but I think it may be around when jobless claims start to lift. Mm -hmm. And I know that's like something you're not even allowed to say because nobody thinks jobless claims are ever going to lift again. Right? That's a thesis. We have a tight employment market yeah. because of the demographics. Therefore, we'll never have a jobless claims again. That would be, you know, the Federal Reserve's part of their thesis. Uh, I have to take uh, the field's question. So, uh, if you don't mind, I'm, if you took a, if anybody that follows Mike Taylor has a wild guess what the most voted up questions are going to be, what ticker would you say? Quickly, quickly, quickly. <laughs> it starts with a P. Uh, you know, this is the thing that I, that I like. You put yourself out there. But what I don't like is people that view sometimes take picks as like, oh, that's his whole portfolio. No, no. PCT, which is the question, is part of the portfolio. We, the amount of names that you have on at the same time is incredible. I've been trying to tell people, uh, trying to coach people through sizing of a portfolio. Like, you know, your long's bigger than your shorts, have a lot of shorts, you know, have a lot of asymmetry in the shorts, have a diversified short book, et cetera, et cetera. But I just wanted to say that because I'd like the audience to, uh, to, to see both in you, like not just a, you as a stock pick. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's a stock pick. You own a, you own a crap ton of the stock, okay? I do. Yeah, so. And I do, and I own, and I, I, yeah, we just closed it. So I am an owner, yeah. and I own more than I did on this dip. Um, I'm really, I hate saying I'm really excited about something, ever, because that means that maybe I have an emotional attachment. And I, you know me, I never want to have an emotional attachment to everything. Being very, you know, in the box, I can make very yeah. rational decisions. Um, PCT had a modest hiccup that was not responded to as modest uh, yeah. in their uh, scale up. Um, essentially, they lost it lost electricity and it broke a seal and they didn't know it and they had to tear it all apart, found it, and uh, they got to it. So it probably won't happen again. In the main, um, in the main in plant. In the big plant, they yeah. have a plant. So for those of you that don't know, uh, PCT is a, uh, I wanna say it's a plastics manufacturing company. Now their input is recycled plastic, but it's essentially a plastics manufacturing company. And what's unique about it in my eyes is that uh, PCT can make polypropylene for less than it takes for a petroleum, petroleum company to make polypropylene. And right. they make it from a recycled source. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the finished product that comes out the other end is more pure than, uh, than new polypropylene from the uh, petroleum company. Uh, so for its saleability and market, it's wonderful. And you get to say that it's recycled and on and on. So they finished their first plant in Ironton, Ohio, and they have financing uh, for the foreseeable future, enough cash. Uh, and to do how many more plants? One or two? Oh my God. One, two. Well, the, there are five in production now, okay. uh, Asia and Europe, and I think there's going to be at least five plus in the U.S. And this, so this is why you like it so much, because the, the TAM doesn't have to be addressed. It's already in motion. The TAM. So what many don't understand about it is the model. You might want to compare this to waste management, for instance. Yeah. Recycling company, collecting trash, whatever. Uh, waste management trades at like 26 times free cash flow. It doesn't grow. And I, they have massive capex that has to be renewed over and over. And many use a PCT as a comp for waste management. What is this going to look like? Now, PCT is probably going to have a 45% free cash flow yield uh, because they don't have to renew all the equipment 
like waste management does. Mm. Once they build it, that's it. And so their EBITDA margin is going to be very similar to their free cash flow margin oh, for a wow. very long period of time. And so that's, you know, that's after the plant gets done. They build the Augusta, Georgia plant, which will be much, much bigger than the first. Uh, but it's very rare that I find, uh, and we talked about this years ago when I first found it, um, and I wasn't the only one that found it. Uh, a, a friend of mine happens to be the largest shareholder, and he's put or committed into this name, you ready? About 400 mil. So he's there and really understands this. And I, I'm so glad to have him as a friend to talk to uh, because it's, uh, there aren't a lot of people that can handicap this. Mm -hmm. It is a new technology that is very simple. Uh, it, is, it works like a refinery mm -hmm. where they simply take waste polypropylene, clean it in water, you know, wash it, melt it in butane. Yes, that's flammable, but it's under control conditions, and then run it through filters and a spinner under heat and pressure so it stays melted, and then they take off the temperature and pressure and it elutes. That would be, turns from a liquid back into a solid, like a snowflake, and then it blows out the rear, and that's how it works. So it really takes electricity, heat, pressure, and butane, and that's essentially what it is. Not very complicated, chemically very simple. So and it's simpler to understand than some of these AI narratives. That's well, <laughs> it's, it's very simple, but nobody's done it before, so it's been hard to handicap. Yeah. But I believe that in the very near term, PCT is going to have their first shipments to their biggest partner, Procter & Gamble, and it turns into an experimental hypothetical company into an execution growth company. Mm -hmm. And what really attracts me to it, uh, aside from the gigantic TAM and the margins, is that when they get through this plant, they're on to Augusta plant, they have five, six, seven more plants coming down the road. I get to be an investor in a company where I can't model out a sequential down comp for the rest of my adult life. Mm -hmm. And it's in the Russell. There are so few companies that have that profile in the Russell that when they see this, probably the front half of next year, Fidelity, T. Rowe, all these other guys that are benchmarking are gonna be like, Ooh, we have to own that. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, and that's that's so your time and space window is narrowing, very much yeah, so because we're on the cusp of going from, hey, does it work? To how big will it be? Yeah. And once they turn that page, that equation over, and they start modeling this out, it's going to be very meaningful. Very hard for the big investors to say no. Well, I think I mean when you take the time or you get the time to actually walk through the longer term idea. That's what being a long term investor actually is. You know, Being an investor isn't what a lot of you uh, that just started doing this post pandemic think it could or should be, which is you get a pick, a stock pick from Mike Taylor, you get a pop on Hedge ITV. That's not what he's in it for. I mean, he can't get out. I mean, his friend definitely can't get out of it. Uh, 400 million bucks worth of that. that yep. I would say that that's probably, well, it depends yep. on how much money he has, which I'm guessing uh, irresponsibly long it would not he's be. He's done okay. Yeah, it's, I, uh, I, But I will give him credit, and I didn't name who he is, but you can see who the largest shareholder is in it. And if this works, and I believe it will, he will be credited, in my view, with single-handedly making this possible. That's awesome. Where choosing the management, turning it around, getting it done, is people on the ground floor pushing and pulling to make this happen. And it will change for recycling. It'll be a very, very big deal because this is something that has never been able to be done before. Almost no polypropylene is recycled. And aside from that, none of it is recycled in a way where it's actually usable. Mm -hmm. Aside from Chinese trinkets, yeah, you know. Um, so. Okay, the next question. I think we uh, you covered some important ground on that. Uh, this one's from Brian in Boston. Uh, a lot of upvotes. Uh, you got you have more votes on questions than anybody in the history of, of real conversations, which we have a long history of that now, right, Eric? I mean, in terms of years and numbers. Um, so nice job engaging people. You're teaching people. You're you know, they're obviously paying attention to what you say. Um, Brian from Boston, companies like Signet that you highlighted last year have hung in fairly well. Uh, do you finally see pricing power SIG. for SIG diminishing yes. with greater effect? And what are some of the other, uh, well, I guess let's just address uh, SIG or anything. Yeah, we should talk about SIG. I embarrassedly position SIG. Yeah. It has held up well. They're a market share gainer in the garbage jewelry uh, outlet. Garbage jewelry. Well, they, they've, <laughs> it and, is. And actually, I will give them credit. Management has done an amazing job 
of turning a fragmented disaster of an industry into something a bit more organized. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not going to blow the hell up. <laughs> so their thesis is that weddings are on the rise. Ooh, that's a new one. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I have a 14-year-old daughter, not happening soon. So uh, no, I really think that weddings are not on the rise. This uh, younger generation is, they're, they're basically the management is saying, oh, weddings are gonna uh, go up, because of COVID, yeah. you know. No weddings, COVID afterwards, well, this big wedding boom, hasn't happened. So they're sort of waiting for it. And they're saying that there's gonna be a $600 million, I'm pulling it all out of my head now, $600 million tailwind next year to a wedding boom. And uh, I don't think those announcements are in the mail. Mm. That's what I'll a say. A wedding boom into a the, the throat uh, of a recession, that's a, interesting. And the student loans. So I look at that and I disagree with their thesis. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's now, good. they do have a little bit of margin improvement, though, uh, because they're getting into the synthetic diamonds. Uh, okay. And they're cheaper, but their margins are better. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm not sure how much dollar wise that's actually going to uh, benefit them. So my bet is no wedding boom and no big tailwind. But these things are in the numbers. And so if I'm looking at a bearish uh, consumer for ages 40 years and younger, those are all the people buying rings, and this is sold out of a mall. So that's exactly, it. you know, you got, you got Jared, and then you got Macy's. And I want to be short both. It's, it's, so. it's like whenever I look at uh, any of Brian's names, which this would be one of them as well, you just, instead of looking at the three-year post-pandemic chart, which is like, oh, it's come down off the highs. You pull back like all of Brian's career chart on Signet, or you pull back like the pre-pandemic all-time highs for these things, particularly the ones that are in malls. And you are, you, you, it's like, oh, it's hanging in. That was what the comment was made. You know, like people, I, I really want you to go back and really think about the structural issues about basically being in a mall, okay? Now this is like a, this is a pretty easy one for people to understand. Um, Another question, this is more on the market, and it's got a lot of votes, but, and it, again, I think it's kind of, um, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, I just, I just think it's like, this is not how Mike and I think, like how you asked the question, but people want to know. Like, I, I think people want to take all this hard work that we do as a team, you can see my team, you've been here today, uh, and just get it down to a simple answer. Like what, so this, so top voted question, quite literally from, thank you, Sarah, from London, do you believe we see new all-time highs in the fourth quarter or that we retest the lows from earlier this year? Like, people need that answer if there's an answer. I personally yes. don't have that answer. Do you have that answer? One of my favorite questions <laughs> is, what is your price target in the S&P? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. What is your price? Or, or they say, well, what is your valuation basement in the S&P? And I would say something like, I'll bring up the auto loans issue with the value of the collateral crashing at the same time. And it's not a matter of what the price is, it's when the shoes are done dropping, yeah. or enough have dropped. Mm -hmm. We haven't even talked about Italian debt. That's gonna be a big problem. Yeah. And nobody knows about it. But Nobody's there really talking is no, there, there is no, and again, we're not, I'm not trying to be critical to, to the question that I would love to have the answer. You know, I would love to know you know, I would have loved to know that Nick Chubb was going to blow, blow a wheel last night if, if he was my top pick in the draft. I would have loved to know that. But I couldn't know that. Mm -hmm. Like this morning, I was using, again, Dr. Lee Hood's analogy, which is taking all the modern day tools that we have, all the sophistication, all the real time nature of it all. He's like, it reminds me of the days when I was in the Beartooth Mountains in Montana. Um, and you wouldn't know what you're going to do next till you got over and looked at the next ridge line. Yes. And to me, I was like, beautiful. One of the world's greatest scientists, you know, I don't even know what, what his accomplishments are, but just looking at his accolades, there are plenty. And it's like, that's exactly how I look at a market. I don't know what I'm going to see until I start to see it, right? You see a lack of pricing power. You don't see a date on the calendar that the S&P 500 is going to go back to its lows. Or a price. Or a price. Yeah. And, but I do see a lot of problems. Yep. And, and look, any market you look at, you always see problems. Okay. Right. Now, what I try to couple that with is, okay, we have problems, but our company is going to pooch numbers, right? Are we going to whiff? And then which ones are probably going to whiff? Uh, which ones have a fairy tale that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> and and those are the things that I, especially ones that people don't quite know yet. Yeah. And uh, those are things that get me really excited. And sort of my excitement level right now, look, as you know, coming into 22, I, I couldn't have shouted it. It was the worst setup I've ever seen for stocks, ever, coming from 21 to 22. That's when he it pulled was, the toilet paper out, oh. of his shirt, out of his jacket. He had it at Hedge Eye Live, pulled out a toilet paper with a list of shoes that were going to drop. Yeah. And they pretty much all did. Yeah, well, and more. we're still ongoing. Yeah, yeah, we're still ongoing. So, uh, but, but this moment coming forward, it, it's not as easy as that. I think there's gonna be winners and losers, whereas everything then was a loser. I think it's gonna be a great stock picking market. So on the other side of that, I'm bullish some really boring stuff. Uh, some not so boring either. Well, um, what, you said, what you said on you know, just where we're at in terms of science, I mean, that's a launch pad for ostensibly a lot of good ideas that aren't... Yes, uh, you know, a non-cyclical yeah. high alpha, and I do have a meaningful position in pink. Mm -hmm. I think I'm one of the largest shareholders mm -hmm. in pink since the inception, or right around that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that is a buffer. Now, granted, like that pink doesn't trade anything like DoorDash mm -hmm. or the Qs, right? Mm -hmm. So it is really a non-correlated offsides bet. Mm -hmm. that I have on as a book structure. But I'll also have long, I'm long the, the, the digital music players, mm -hmm. um, Spotify, uh, and there's a couple others. Uh, they actually have a touch of pricing power. Right. And they are indentured, meaning there's only a handful of them. It's the only place you can go for music. And they Spotify. have pricing power. <laughs> and it's gonna comp through for over a year. Uh, things that don't have pricing power on the other side. Netflix. The models say they have pricing power, but if you listen to the call, or the, uh, they, they just had a conference, and they, were like, they were just saying, well, well, maybe things aren't going so good. But in, if you look at the street models for next year, the entire price target and everything is dependent upon more price increases for Netflix. I think the chance of that actually being successful is zero. So yeah. that's Long not going to do so well. So on a Short Long Netflix. spot, short Netflix. Or, or if you want to do the demographic, the demographic is uh, I need my music. I can't live without it. I'm a millennial, but I'm not ordering a $30 lunch from Shake Shack. And so I'm going to be long my music. I'm going to be short my DoorDash mm. like that. And right. so that's kind of the book that I've assembled here. And I think that, um, well, of course, I think it'll work out. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. So far, so good. You know, I mean, you, you, and then you're, you're trying to time my clock. We got like two minutes left. That was that was good, man. Oh, <laughs> you I, see I didn't see it. Yeah, that's uh, when I look over there. It's not because I'm going cross-eyed. It's because mm -hmm. there's a camera there. That's my only version of a teleprompter that I have. Uh, and also, um, I'm a bullishly positioned. Oh, you'll hate me. You'll hate me. You ready? Verizon Wireless. Really? Yeah. I don't and hate and I hate it. I hate it, but I could buy anything. getting rid of your cell phone is going to be the last thing they get rid of. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, 5G is done being built out. Well, as soon as you say that, everyone's going to say, "I got to buy Apple," but you already own Apple. So. Oh no, they're <laughs> not going to upgrade their phones, which is really good for Verizon and not for Apple. Okay, they're going to keep their old crappy phone, but they're going to keep paying that Verizon bill, and the cash flows for a lot of these wireless players, T-Mobile. Um, and Verizon is going to be very, very attractive and meaningful moving forward. Mm. Uh, they're near uh, lows, uh, but they've all stabilized. You'll probably like the chart as soon as it breaks up, if yep. you pull one of them up. Uh, team you're just waiting for that signal. Now, one of them has a big buyback on. I think that's the T-Mobile. The yeah, T-Moose, uh, which is the ticker is T-M-U-S, uh, plus Freebird, Andrew Friedman, who's an excellent analyst on our team, likes it. Um, yeah, Spotify, I gotta ask him about that. That looks like, you know, coming back from the living dead. Um, you know, I like those though. Pricing. Yeah, pricing. You got pricing. Yeah. And I'm gonna pair up things. You got pricing, it'll stick. You don't. And that's my book. It's a great way to think about it. And, that's, and it's a big deal. And I thought it would happen around mid-year where we start seeing that dichotomy, that divergence mm -hmm. of uh, pricing versus losing pricing. And it's a really exciting moment because we're gonna see it manifest bigly Mm -hmm. It's my favorite Trumpism. Yeah, there's an ETF for um, uh, that I own called the Inflation Beneficiaries ETF. You might know the guys oh, at Horizon Kinetics. I, I've never heard of it. They're good. Yeah. I, I, I NFL. What a great ticker. Mm, gotta love it. In inflation. So th they would be benefiting from inflation. Being long, energy is benefiting from inflation. So, uh, man, I got a lot to talk to my analysts about. You I'm know? long energy too. I hate it, yeah. but I'm long it. 
<laughs> I hate it, but I'm walking. I hate the it, thing but that, I'm walking. The thing that only you would say. But um, That's true. Thanks for bringing this, man. Thank I'm gonna, you. I'm going to bring this to my desk and start waving it at Rooster. Everything will work. Yeah, it's great. But uh, it's good to see you again, and, and thanks for making so much time for everybody. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. He is the, un no, well, the one and only Mike Taylor. The guy's got this. I mean, come on. Thanks for joining us.